Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of July 20th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, in a recent op-ed, Senator Stedman seems more concerned about future generations than he is this one. Second, Senator Giesel sends out a mailer that claims things she's not. And third, the governor of Wyoming takes on his oil price-driven budget crisis in a way Alaska hasn't, but should. And now, let's join Michael. Let's jump into this. You've got uh, you've got some big things to crack into. Uh, first and foremost, we're going to talk a little bit about... Uh, Bert Stedman, he put an opinion piece out here a few days ago talking about protecting the permanent fund. And, uh, you know, he keeps using that phrase, and I don't think it means what you think it means um, kind of thing. What, what, what's, your, what's your hot take on it? <laughs> well, I think that's exactly right. I mean, Bert's piece is, is, is uh, a, a self-praise piece, if you will, uh, about uh, the move of roughly $5 billion out of the earnings reserve account to the to the corpus of the permanent fund, and then some uh, SB 26 uh, praise uh, thrown in along the way. SB 26 is the statute that limits the the draw that the legislature can make from uh, from the permanent fund. Uh, Bert uh, goes on and expresses concern about uh, the remaining amount in the earnings reserve account and concerns about whether the legislature might uh, might uh, break into that, go beyond SB 26 and break into that and start spending from that, um, and, and, and the impact that that might have on, on future generations. And, and frankly, all of that, I, I, don't, I don't have a disagreement with, with any of that. I think the $5 billion move uh, into the corpus was a, was a good move. I, 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 I have concerns about whether we're using the right percent number on the draw from the the permanent fund for for the uh, POMV but I agree in concept with the with the with the POMV concept and, and limiting the draw from the earnings reserve account or limiting the draw from the permanent fund and and I also uh, agree with Bert about concerns about having that having a, a too much in the earnings reserve account and people and the legislature breaking through and starting to use that as yet another piggy bank. We've seen over the last over the last decade uh, what happens when the legislature thinks it has uh, a savings cushion. It just uses it up. It doesn't stop spending. It doesn't it doesn't uh, uh, concern itself with uh, with fiscal responsibility. It just keeps going. And, and over as Bert notes, over the last uh, eight years uh, since we went into deficit, we've used up. He uses the number 16, but when you add uh, when you add the the the, uh, uh, the st- uh, statutory budget reserve, the SBR, uh, we're about 20 billion dollars. Uh, we've used up 20 billion dollars in uh, in savings, and that's right. and that's a concern. It's a concern about you know what might happen to the earnings reserve account, how quickly the earnings reserve account might be uh, used up if uh, if if we broke uh, past the SB 26 barrier and started using that. But all of this. All of this is concern that, that Bert's expressing about future generations. We have to we have to retain the, the the permanent fund, the integrity of the permanent fund. We have to put money in the permanent fund. We have to protect the ERA so that there is so that there's money earnings coming from the permanent fund 
uh, for future generations. He ignores, to me, he ignores what's right in front of him, which is the current generation uh, of Alaskans that have that have a statutory entitlement, a statutory right, uh, a statutory benefit created by Governor Hammond to a portion of the earnings reserve uh, that comes to Alaskans. It's in statute in the same way that SB 26 is in statute. It's a statutory uh, uh, direction. Um, and and Burt completely ignores that. Senator Stedman completely ignores that uh, in his entire piece. It's all focused on future generations, preserving the permanent fund for future generations, using it for future generations, uh, and completely ignores what this this legislature, uh, with with Senator Stedman as co-chair of finance, what this generation, or uh, what this legislature is doing to uh, to the current generation. So it's a it's a you know usually usually I object to legislators who are focused too much on this on this uh, uh, generation and saying oh we've got to raid the ERA we've got to take money from the ERA we got to take money from the savings accounts the SBR and the CBR. Uh, we don't need to fill them back up. We need to, you know, we need to get all this money in our hands for current generations. Usually, my concern is people are focused too much on the current generation and trying to give money to the current generation at the expense of future generations. Here's Bert focused almost entirely on future generations and just sort of skipping over what we're doing, what we're doing to the to the current generation. Now, Bert would say, I'm sure if he were on here, Bert would say, well. No, I'm I'm looking after the current generation also because you know we got all this we we've got the 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 POMV draw we've got the the draw from the earnings reserve and we're and we the legislature are deciding how to spend it, but that's I mean that's the problem the legislature is deciding how to spend all that money twenty one plus eleven uh, plus the governor are deciding how to spend half of the permanent fund earnings that are supposed to be put in the hands of Alaskans so they can decide uh, uh, what that money is spent on and they can decide for themselves uh, what they need in life as opposed to having this all legislatively directed uh, uh, by, uh, by, by legislative fiat. So it's, it, I, I'm just frustrated with, 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 with this focus that Bert now has on future generations, and we've got to do this for future generations, we've got to do these things for future generations, all of which is correct, all of which is all of which is fine. Yes, we need to put money in the permanent fund corpus. Yes, we need to to limit our draw from the ERA. Yes, we need to be concerned about future generations. But he's just he's entirely ignoring what we're doing to the current well, generation, if, and, and entirely ignoring about the, uh, the 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 adverse impact we're having on the current generation. Uh, Brad Keith leads our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Isn't this a politician problem, Brad? I mean, where they hyper focus on one component, but they never look at it holistically. I mean, they never look at the whole picture. They focus in on their one little thing and that's what they laser focus in on and they never look at it from the holistic aspect of okay you're doing that over there there are unintended consequences if you do that this is what happens over here uh i mean isn't again isn't that kind of a politician's problem i think it's i yeah it's in part a politician's problem but it's in part i mean bert bert's been around bert's been in the legislature for a long time he was actually co-chair of finance uh, back in the late 2000s, when we started on this spending spree, uh, and and continued until the 2012 election, I think, when we elected what we thought were a bunch of conservatives, including Kathy Geisel, um, uh, to the led to the Senate, and Burt was replaced as Senate Finance Chair. He's he's been around this uh, for for a long time, and 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 understands, I think, uh, as well as anybody, the impact. Uh, of fiscal policy on on Alaskans, so yeah, it's 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 in part that that he is hyper focused on on one thing to uh, ignoring the other, um, but it's it's just disappointing that a that a that a co chair of Senate Finance um, uh, is not is not viewing both current the current generation and the future generation uh, giving giving weight to both the current gen- future the current generation. Uh, and and the future generation. Uh, we continue, Brad Keithley uh, again. Alaskans for sustainable budgets. 
Uh, you know, this seems to be, again, part of the problem as well, is that they continue to laud the fact that one component of this is obviously, you know, in statute, look at SB 26, look at what we've done over here, look at what we did over here. Uh, you know, all these, we passed all these laws, but we ignore the laws that don't suit us. And you've pointed out several times that the fact that we've had a statutory law in the books for nearly 40 years and they've decided to ignore it has become the uncomfortable elephant in the room. It is. And, and, you know, and, and, and they, they do ignore it. They, they, they're, they change it. They've amended that statute. The, the, the 21 plus 11 of them have changed that statute without amending it. I mean, they, they can't get an amendment passed. They could not change if, if they could, they would try, uh, but they can't get an amendment passed, uh, to, to that statutory allocation. Uh, the PFD allocation, but but then they then they just ignore it, and it's just it is it is not um, a responsible public policy to ignore to ignore statutes. Now the Supreme Court said in 2017 that 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 the legislature could treat those revenues and appropriate those revenues however the however the 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 legislature wanted, but that didn't. That didn't negate the statute. It didn't. Uh, it didn't uh, 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 wipe the statute off the books. Uh, the statute's still there, uh, and, and 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 that statute continues to say that that pot of money, the permanent fund earnings, are are supposed to be allocated 50 percent to uh, Alaskans and 50 percent uh, to uh, to government, with a portion of that going to with a portion of that going to inflation proofing and. And, and and this is the legislature. This is the legislature that passes laws and tells us that we ought to pay attention to laws, and and, and prescribes criminal penalties for failure to to, to apply laws. And, and they continue to ignore that statute. And for Bert to for Bert to say for Bert to just ignore that statute's existence and what it means for the current generation, and 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 go on and on and on about he's, how he's protecting future generations. It's just uh, it's just not good policy, and it's not what you would ever want to hear uh, in Congress uh, or any state legislature from a Senate Finance Committee chair. It is right. it is it is it is irresponsible fiscal policy just to continue to ignore that statute. So it, it's a I mean I've been frustrated with Burt for a long period of time. Um, uh, this this just sort of re heightens it that the legislature is is just doing anything they can. Uh, to avoid a statute that says, uh, that's been on the books 40 years, avoid a statute that says a portion of this money is to go to Alaskans for Alaskans, not 21 plus 11 in the legislature, but for Alaskans decide to decide what to spend it on. Yep. Uh, this, of course, leads us over to number two, which uh, Kathy Geisel suffers from a similar thing where she, uh, again, self-aggrandizing uh, and everything else, only this one's a little bit more ridiculous. Uh, charging on the white knight towards the thing, protecting the princess of the, uh, this, this new mailer is something else. Yeah. For people who haven't seen it, I, do you have it up on the screen or I, I have it up on the screen right now? Yeah, it's, it is, uh, it, it's, it's bizarre. It's a Catholic. Kathy is a St. George slaying the dragon. Uh, I'd guess, um, uh, on a white, white steed, uh, uh, protecting Alaskans. And, 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 and here's the text. Kathy Geisel fights the liberal agenda with courage and conviction. No income tax, no gun control, soft on, no soft on crime, no runaway spending, and no Green New Deal. I, I don't know what the heck the Green New Deal is. That's a federal thing. So I guess, I guess she hasn't proposed it in the state so that she's protecting us against it. But here's the two things. Here's the two things on that that are just absolutely false. One, she has – uh, passed an income tax. She has repeatedly, since 2016, voted for uh, a, an income tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. That's what PFD cuts are. The classic economic definition of an income tax is the diversion of income from the private sector into government, the compulsory diversion of income from the private sector uh, into into government. And the PFD and, and PFD cuts are clearly that. PFDs by statute are intended to come into the Alaska private sector, to come into the hands of, of Alaska families. Cutting those PFDs, with, withholding those PFDs 
doing doing the same thing as as your investment bank as your as your banker might do if he said, well, I just need more money this month. Instead of you getting money out of your account, I'm going to take money out. I'm going to take the money into my into my account. Uh, diverting that money into government is the classic definition of an income tax. It's an income tax that falls hardest, as, as we've talked about on the show before. It's an income tax that falls hardest on middle and lower income Alaska families. The only the only reason she gets away with saying no income tax is because PFD cuts are not called income taxes uh, in the in the in the in the in the common media. But from a classic economic definition of what an income tax is, that's exactly what they are. There's the diversion of of income uh, from uh, the private sector into uh, into government. So that's right. just, it's a it's a false claim. Well, and I think it's interesting. She's trying to wrap herself in the flag here of conservatism. Uh, I mean, she's she's touting the talking points of endorsed by the NRA, protecting the Second Amendment, you know, pro-life, pro-business. Uh, but again, I think she doth protest too much, a lifelong conservative who basically is advocating for more government spend, uh, taking that money out of the hands of Alaskans, not allowing people to make their own decisions. Uh, I mean, her commitment to conservative values may be stronger than ever, which is what she says on here. But uh, I, Ken, she's using that word, and I'm not sure she, it means what she thinks it means. Yeah, uh, it doesn't. I mean, what's what's really what's really shocking about this? Every time I think of Senator Giesel, in 2012, uh, I supported her election. She was she had she had not joined the bipartisan majority. She had stood out. Uh, in a in a very small minority, I think there were four members, sixteen in the bipartisan majority and four uh, in the minority, uh, because they were too liberal. They were doing too many. They were doing too many uh, bad things. And Kathy, in 2012, when the when the so-called conservatives came back into power, um, uh, the bipartisan majority was defeated, and the Senate and the Republicans formed uh, the majority for a first time. Charlie Huggins was the was the Senate president. Um, and they replaced uh, they replaced Bert as uh, Senate Finance Chair. Kathy was one of the the gung ho uh, one of the gung ho conservatives, and 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 I recall they the Senate the, the Senate Republicans went on a retreat before the session in December after they were elected, and they came back with with three items, three priority items, and and priority item number three I'll never forget this was developing a sustainable budget. Um, and Kathy spoke at a conference that I was that I was chairing at the time, and she went on and on and on about how they were going to get spending under control. This is 2012, how they were going to get spending under control and how they were going to restore, you know, fiscal sanity to the to the legislature. Just on and on and on. Um, and 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 you know, there was a lot of a lot of hope. A lot of excitement around uh, the legislature doing that, and then they failed. And then, <laughs> then they, you know, under Governor Parnell, they just kept spending more and more and more right, and more. Right, right. Uh, but she's run. She's run like this. She's run like, as, as this sort of candidate uh, every time. 2012, 2016, 20, now 2020. But she's she's never lived up to it. She, she's never uh, walked the walked the talk uh, of uh, of being an actual fiscal conservative. And and now for her to claim. That she's against an income tax is just is just the height of of um, of, of of hypocrisy. Yeah, hypocrisy. Yeah, hypocrisy. Yeah, hypocrisy. Yeah, uh, just, just the just the height. Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, Brad, can we talk for just a minute about the symbology here of Kathy Geisel, um ascribing herself sainthood to strike down the dragon? And, uh, you know, to fight off the, I mean, the, the it, wow. I mean, all I could say is just, <laughs> wow. You are St. George charging in on your charger to slay the dragon to protect the princess. Um, I don't know who talked her into that, but just, I, I just, I, I have no words at this point. Yeah, it's, it's, it's one of those things where you run, you run on principles that are entirely different from what you live when you govern. I mean, she, if, if she had uh, protected the PFD, if she had protected the income tax uh, of diverting the PFD, that would be a great thing. I mean, these are all great principles to, to have, have, have lived up to. And if she had done those things, uh, uh, that would be, you know, I'd, 
I'm, I'm not sure sainthood is the right thing, but but that would be that would be you know an appropriate thing to point out that you had done all those things. She hasn't done half those things. I mean, right. by, but Mike Shower for people who haven't heard it, Mike Shower did a did a, a Facebook live. Uh, uh, in the last week, talking about re- talking about spending and sort of eviscerating the claim that that people make that 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 the Senate has controlled runaway spending, uh, she hasn't done the things that she's that she's listed there. So it's it's you know it's 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 as it's it's an aspiration. Maybe it's maybe it's Kathy saying, "I wish I'd done those things," and if I had done those things, you know, I'd be a great person. But she hasn't done them. Uh, and it's 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 a, it's a huge disconnect between between you know what you claim you've done and and the reality of what you've actually done. Right, right, absolutely. I mean, it, it, and the fact that that you would, I mean, I guess the fact that you would allow that to go out there on your behalf uh, to me is like. Is that how you see yourself? Do you see yourself as the person on the charger out there tilting at the evil windmills of the Brad Keithleys and the Michael Dukes of the world to uh, to slay us because we just don't we just don't understand um, we just don't understand that you're misunderstood. Is that what this whole thing is about? She's just misunderstood. I mean, I, I'm I, I'm really trying to wrap my brain around it because her whole her whole commentary here on. Uh, I'm a lifelong conservative. Really? I mean, you've done nothing but grow budgets since 2012. I mean, you've really you've defended government spending. You have, uh, you know, protected uh, and prevented people from being able to vote their conscience with the binding caucus. I mean, I could think of a of a half a dozen things right now that are definitely anti-conservative principles. I mean, you know, but you're a lifelong conservative. I, I just I don't know how to even wrap my head around that. Well, that's that's how you have to run. In, I mean, that's that's how people run in Alaska, right? I'm a lifelong conservative. You say that, and 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 you try to back that up, and people. But I mean, Josh Revac's doing that in his district right now. I'm a lifelong conservative, uh, and and you know, claim that and and run that way. You see, you know, his red signs, and you see conservative in bold print across the, those red signs. You, yeah, the, the the problem is. <laughs> The problem is they're not living up to those to those values. That, that's how they think they need. That's how they run. I mean, that's how they how, that's how they view their their constituents. Uh, and those are the principles that they think their their principle their constituents value. But when they get there, they're not they're not living up to that. I mean, Geisel at, it, it, in her actions is a plutocrat, right? She's looking out for the top twenty percent. Right. She 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 accepts an income tax, but she wants a form of income tax that doesn't hit the top twenty percent. Um, she she accepts uh, runaway spending uh, because uh, because that's how she's protecting you know the top twenty percent. The deal with the Democrats is uh, you get to spend what you want to spend. Uh, just don't tax my just don't tax the top twenty percent uh, to raise the money to do it. Tax middle and lower income Alaska families. Yeah, she. She knows she has to run as a conservative, but she's just not. <laughs> excuse me, she's just not living up to to that principle when uh, when she governs. Yeah, and and uh, and again, I I look back at her. Uh, I just look back at her, her own self image, and I wonder how in the world you could see yourself that way, other than. You know, I guess uh, you know the, you you tell yourself a lie often enough, and I guess it could become true uh, in your mind anyway. So maybe that's maybe that's what we're facing at this point. So you know, you can look at other states, and you can see I mean, the the former Speaker of the House of the New York Assembly just got sentenced to prison for some extended period for corruption in office. Um, and you can look at other states, and you can see people who have gotten in power. Um, and and they think they're doing the right thing. I mean, his defense was, "Look at what I've done for the state. Look at what I've done for, you know, for 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 minorities in this state. Look at what I've." And and you know, they get in power and they think they're, you know, they 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 they, they think all the compromises they're making is to is to do something good. They they tell themselves that fantasy. Um, and and that's I mean that's sort of Geisel. She tells herself that she's doing these things. Uh, that the compromises she's making uh, are are for the greater good. That uh, that the compromise of the of, of agreeing to PFD cuts is for the greater good of protecting uh, 
uh, the top 20 percent and protecting the oil industry from uh, from being subject to uh, to taxes as long as as long as we can relieve the pressure by taking money out of middle and lower income Alaska families through PFD cuts that that we've protected the top 20 percent and that's really you know that's her goal but but the but the problem is she is she's compromised away those principles she says she upholds you know being conservative in government uh, ensuring that all Alaskans uh, share fairly in in the state's wealth she's compromised away those those principles uh, as, as she's as she's gone on and and I you know she probably does see herself as St. George uh, just like as, as we were talking in the break just like the the former speaker of the New York Assembly sees himself as the protector of of the downtrodden and minorities. He's going to jail <laughs> for right, corruption right, right. In, in the things in the things he did in office. But you know, his defense is, by gosh, I looked out for minorities and and the downtrodden. I did all these good things for them. I, you just you you get when you get into power, sometimes you get a corrupted sense of of uh, a, a distorted sense of 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 what you're doing. Uh, just to hang on to power, and that's I think that's what's happened to to Senator Giesel. She's she's just become um, she, she's become uh, she's she's too compromised to hang on to power, to hang on to protect what she thinks you know is is really is really important. She's become too compromised in that to really see what she's done. And and when she says no income tax, well, she has had an income tax. I mean, right, she's, had, right. she's had a huge income tax on she's, middle and lower income Alaska families. Right. She's not being honest with herself intellectually or otherwise. Final thoughts here, Brad. What are uh, what what do you want to leave us with? Well, I think I think this the the Giesel mailer is is symptomatic of a larger problem. I think you have legislators um, who um, have a, have a view of themselves of the things they've done and the things they've accomplished that isn't accurate. Uh, Giesel's certainly one of them. Uh, Jennifer Johnson's another. She would tell the same story as Giesel, that she slayed the dragon of income tax at the very same time as she's imposing a deep income tax on middle and lower income Alaska families. Josh Rebeck would say the same thing. Mark Newman would say the same thing out, out in the Valley. Mark Newman would say, you know, I've, I've been conservative and I've, I've pushed for conservative uh, principles, but he hasn't. When he was chair of House Finance, spending grew. It didn't. It didn't decline. Uh, they didn't do the sort of in-depth study of, uh, of of the causes of spending that a that a House Finance Committee chairman could direct. Um, and, and I people just. I mean, we have legislators who just have a different view of what they've accomplished, uh, a different view of what they've been doing than 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 is the reality on the ground. And I think that the 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 John Coghill's another. I think that the, the challenge here is for the challengers to get constituents to look at the facts, at, at, at the actuality of what's happened under the legislators during the legislators' term, um, as opposed to letting the legislator get away with his with with his or her own self description of their of their accomplishments, and when and, and get get constituents to look at the facts of what's happened. Diesel claims there hasn't been an income tax, but there has been. There's been the diversion of private income uh, to government, which is the classic economic definition of an income tax, and it's hit and it's been structured in a way that hits middle and lower income Alaska families hardest. Diesel claims that she's restrained spending, but she hasn't. Here's the spending. Go through the shower presentation of, of here's the spending. Get constituents to focus on what's actually happened as opposed to the, the legislators you know, self view of, of being St. George slaying the dragon. Right. No, absolutely. Uh, I mean, Ned, uh, uh, first and foremost, just a self aggrandizing kind of view. I mean, I just, I have to chuckle when it comes down to it. Uh, just to think that there's, there's a bit of hubris b- baked in there. Uh, kind of a, we know better than you kind of thing. This is yep. just, this is just kind of the epitome of that when it's all said and done. Uh, don't you know, we're protecting you from the dragon. You didn't even know what's going on. Uh, so anyway, um, all right, well, let's, uh, take a look at, uh, our number three here of the weekly top three. Now that we've, uh, we've, we've psychoanalyzed Kathy Giesel's, uh, St. George complex. Um, let's talk a little bit of, uh, about, uh, what's happening across the country. And one of the big things that's going on is the fallout from the virus is turning into a shortfall for many different governments, 
uh, you know, both uh, statewide and rural, uh, uh, you know, counties, boroughs, cities, all feeling it. And uh, Wyoming is now have looking facing this huge budget shortfall as well. Uh, and you're saying this might be a an example we can follow because they've decided to uh, they've decided to make some changes. It's an example we should follow. There's a there's a good article on Wyoming in a in a website called Route 50. Uh, dot com uh, recently pub- published last week um, uh, as as one of Re- uh, as as an article in Route 50. It says one third of our income is gone. A rural state faces a big budget gap. And it's talking about Wyoming coming to grips with the fact that its oil and gas revenues, which are not as important to Wyoming as they are to Alaska, but nevertheless, its oil and gas revenues having having fallen significantly. And it and it walks through how the governor of Wyoming is responding to that, including making 10 percent cuts across the board uh, to all state agencies with some slight modifications. I think it's just 9 percent to his health and, uh, and human services um, uh, uh, agency in Wyoming, but but nevertheless making significant cuts uh, in response to the to the drop in revenues. You and I have talked on the show before about how significant the revenue drop has been um, in 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 Alaska since 2019, since fiscal year 2019, the last year of the Walker administration. Uh, total revenues have dropped 34 percent. They were four billion. Uh, in fiscal year 19, the last year of the Walker, the last Walker budget, uh, they're they're 2.7 billion, account, in, including um, uh, the portion that goes to government from the from the the POMV draw, uh, 2.7 uh, in FY 21, and they'll be even lower uh, in the coming year. What Wyoming is doing in response to this revenue drop uh, is cutting spending. Is 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 making drastic uh, cuts in spending, and the article is great. Uh, is a great uh, uh, overview of how the governor uh, is responding to that, and the cuts he's making, and the and the and the support he's getting uh, uh, from the legislature to uh, to make those cuts. We haven't we haven't even remotely touched that uh, in Alaska. Uh, Senator Shower, as, as I said, did a program. Uh, this past week on on how how we have not cut spending uh, in Alaska, but the 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 other piece of that story and the piece that that people have not focused on uh, is how how big the revenue drop uh, has been has been in Alaska. Yes, you know even if you even if you claim that we've cut spending some, even if you claim uh, even if you claim that we've just held spending even, that's not the story. The revenue has dropped out from underneath us, and the deficit has has exploded. The def the percent of deficit in the twenty nine fiscal year nineteen budget was sixteen percent. Sixteen percent of the of the of spending uh, was uh, was was deficit financed. Fiscal year twenty one, forty two percent of the budget uh, is deficit financed. And as we've talked on the show, when you when you look at fiscal year twenty two, it grows to fifty percent. Of spending is going to have right. to be is, is 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 in deficit. We Wyoming is responding to that by saying, "Whoops, you know, revenues dropped away. Let's focus on where revenues going and let's get spending down uh, to reflect to reflect revenue." We're missing that step uh, uh, in Alaska. I understand the governor's got got is his is concerned about the recall. I understand the constraints that he feels he's under with the recall. But but the the Wyoming governor has stepped up and said, "Look, guys, look at this revenue drop. We've got to respond to it. We're making we're making cuts now. We're not waiting until the next legislature. We're making cuts now to respond to this revenue drop. It's something that Alaska should be doing uh, at the executive level, but isn't." Yeah, well, and he and he goes on to explain later on in this article. He said. Uh, You know, uh, he said he told lawmakers in a hearing that even if the state laid off all of its employees, uh, it would not solve Wyoming's current budget woes. He suggested when that legislators may need to revisit past mandates they've imposed that required state spending. He said, put simply, we don't have enough income. And, And that's the whole thing. I mean, look at how many mandated things we have in state spending right now, all the formulaic driven things and all that other stuff. But nobody's addressing that. Nobody's taking a look at that. Right. And the governor's, you know, talked about this is going to mean cuts. That we, he's talking about furloughs, mandatory furloughs for all state employees to help bring 
you know, uh, personnel costs down. He's talking about fewer dollars flowing towards contracts with uh, with with private business, uh, uh, fewer services for uh, for uh, uh, the elderly, disabled, and low-income residents. But he's facing up to that. I mean, and he's telling the story. Look, our revenues are down. He's starting the story with our revenues are down. We have to confront that. I. I honestly haven't heard Governor Dunleavy talk about revenues. Right. right. Um, I've, I've heard him talk about spending, but I've not heard him lead with the revenue story. And that's that's but but that's the reality that we're facing and that Wyoming is facing. But Wyoming's stepping up to it. Um, and we haven't yet. Yep. And we should be. And uh, we could learn some good lessons here. Uh, maybe somebody's listening. I don't know. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Uh, thanks for coming on board and sharing with us today. We appreciate you being part of the program. Uh, what do we get? Any tease for next week? What we're going to talk about? Or you want to talk a, for a second about what you did with Mike Shower on the budgetary thing or, or what? Well, I, 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 we may be we may be going back to oil taxes uh, next week. I've, I've My views on oil taxes have evolved. Um, and and I, I want to talk about what oil taxes mean in terms of the PFD. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the oil tax uh, initiative really is an opportunity to get tax relief for middle and lower income Alaska families by replacing what we've been using in, in terms of PFD cuts uh, with, uh, with, with some additional revenues coming from the, or some alternative revenues coming from the oil industry. And, I, and that, may be, that may be where we go back next week. All right. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Appreciate you coming on board. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. All right. Thanks so much. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, and keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.